I know I'm going to share the screen. Um, the, the full screen mode. So I'm, I'd like to talk about co periphery structures in directed networks. And this is work um, that I've done with Andrew Elliott, whom many of you know, Angus Chu, while he was a, a MSc project student at Oxford, Maria Bazzi, who is see on the core, Mihai is who's on the core. And this was funded in part by the Turing Accenture Alliance. We've got a paper um, which is published, but we are starting to look at this uh, project again from slightly different angles. And so I thought it would be a good idea to talk about it. So um, you all, well, pretty much you all of all of you know about community structure as a typical mesoscale structure in networks. So in community structures, we've got groups of nodes which are more densely connected within the group than across groups. But in core periphery structure, it's slightly different. We've got a, a well-connected core and we've got a periphery which is well connected to the core, but sparsely connected internally. And of course, we can have both structures in the same network. So we can have co-occurrence of community structure and core periphery structure. So in undirected networks, um, core periphery structure goes back to a notion which long predates network analysis. So in geography and sociology and in international relation and economics, uh, people often thought of a group of core maybe core, core nations, core states, um, core people, and then peripheral people, periphery states, which somehow interact with the core. For networks, it was introduced by Bogatti and Everett in 1999. So with the uh, uh, birth of, so of statistical network analysis. So the idea they had, we part partition the network into two sets. We've got a core set and a periphery set. We've got a dense connection within the core, got a dense, um, a sparse connection between the, uh, within the periphery, but the core nodes are reasonably well connected to the periphery nodes. So in this diagram here, got this core set, periphery set, they're connected. And then the circle is meant to, to say that we've got lots of connections within the core. So there are many variants. There's a continuous model by Bogatti and Everett. We can think of multiple core periphery pairs. So this was examined, for example, by Kyaku and Masuda. We could think of nested core periphery structures. So that's a paper by Thiago Pechotto. So it's been reasonably well studied. And how do we detect core periphery structure in undirected networks? Well, there are different ways. So there's one way is that we optimize a quality function, something like a modularity. So this is um, carried out by Bogatti and Everett originally. Peter Holm has done this, Young Leskovich, uh, Zhang Martin McNewman's group. So that's one way of looking at it. Spectral methods, so that's where Mihai has been doing uh, quite a lot of work at Tradisk and High Mondragon. Um, you could also think of um, optimization based on transport, thinking that core nodes uh, should be on many shortest paths between other nodes in the network and periphery nodes less so. So this is also something which Mihai and his co-workers explored. So many of these methods can extend to a directed network, but uh, the, the catch is that the definition of core and periphery is usually not extended to directed networks. Um, the, the exception of this is uh, Bowtie, which was introduced by Broder et al. And there's a, a big paper by Young et al. in 2011. So Bowtie is the directed structure. So we've got the core, which is densely connected, and we've got one periphery which feeds into the core and another periphery which is fed by the core. And we can actually, we can have multiple peripheries if you like. So this is just a schematic. But this is just one structure which you can think of in terms of directed networks. So here we are going to look at a, a different structure uh, for directed networks where we take each direction into account. Uh, and we propose methods for detecting the structure. We also introduce a new quality measure for directed core periphery structure, which is a bit like modularity. And I will show you how this works on synthetic data briefly. And uh, we also look on three real world data sets, which are faculty hiring, world trade data set and political blocks. 
So this is the structure we're going to look at mainly. So we, so in the paper, we've got a list of structures, but this is the one which we focused on. So we have um, two cores and two peripheries. Two, so, so we have four sets in total. And we, we think that our, each of them have, um, so one, one uh, core set has many incoming edges, so core in, and one has many outgoing edges, ideally only outgoing edges, that's core out. And then we've got two periphery sets, P in, um, which receives, which is high in degree, so receives uh, many edges from C out, and P out, which feeds into many edges of C in. So as an example, so here's the, the network in small again, we could think of information flow. So for example, uh, Mariano Begaris Diaz and his co-workers have looked at Twitter networks. So we could think of um, P out and C out being people sending information into Twitter, where C out is a densely connected group, which sort of communicates among each other. And P out are so individual Twitter accounts, which are not very well connected to the others. And then C in and P in are receivers of the tweets. And again, C in is a group of densely connected um, uh, ag agents, tweets, which uh, exchange information among each other. And P in are just uh, people like me who follow about 30 people on Twitter and uh, just receive the information and don't do much with it. So we could think of other configurations, but here we, we focus on, on this um, configuration. So um, as it's done uh, in the uh, block modeling literature in social sciences, we can think of a block probability matrix. We could think of a, a matrix which links the four different blocks. So we've got four blocks, P out, C in, C out, and P in. And ideally what should happen, C in receives information from P out and from C out, but also from C in itself. So we've got this uh, column of ones. And C out gives information to C in uh, to itself um, and, and also to P in, but not to P out. Um, and all the others are zero. So we've got this L structure. So we've got ones um, in, in these positions which are marked red and otherwise it's zero. So this is the shape we're after. And of course, in, in real networks, we will never see this perfect ordering. So we could think of a synthetic model that we've got probability of having edges. And the simplest one is to have one probability P1 on the L shape and another probability P2 outside the L shape, where we think P1 probability of an edge in the L shape should be larger than P2 typically, but of course it doesn't have to be. So here's a, a simulation uh, on 400 nodes uh, with equally sized blocks, so 100 nodes each. The first three, um, keeping P2 fixed, so P2 is 0 0.1 and P1 is 0 0.8 and the first one 0 0.5 and the second one and 0 0.2 and the third one. So um, on, on the left hand one, when P1 is close to one, when P2 is close to zero, we see the L shape quite clearly and you see it deteriorates. And when P1 and P2 are pretty close, you can just about still make it out. And the, the second uh, three plots are different parameterization. We think of P1 being a half plus P and P2 is a half minus P, so symmetric. So if P is 0 0.4, that means we have to compare 0 0.1 with 0 0.9. So this is even stronger than the uh, leftmost L shape. P is equal to 0 0.2 means we have 0 0.3, 0 0.7 as P1 and P2. And P is 0 0.05, is already pretty close to noise. So, so we, if, you're, if you squint and if you convince yourself, you can just about make out an L shape. And yeah, so, so this is the kind of structure we ideally want to detect. And how do we measure whether what we detect makes sense? So of course, in our synthetic simulations, we can use the adjusted runt index, but in real networks, we may not have ground truth available. So we have two ways of assessing the, the quality of the fit. The first one is via Monte Carlo p-values. 
So we, we generate uh, networks under the null model, which is Bernoulli random graph or directed configuration model. And then we calculate the difference between the probability of connection within the L structure with that outside the L structure. So, so here you look at the first term. So M is our ideal probability matrix. GU, GV is the entry for um, the, the two groups where uh, G, GU is in group U and uh, U is in group GU and V is in group GV. So this would be zero or one. And we multiply this by the adjacency matrix. And uh, we normalize by all the, uh, all the number of nodes in the L shape. And we take away um, th those, uh, those values where we should see a zero in the ideal matrix, but we don't see a zero and normalize by the number of, of nodes where we should see a zero. So this is our first um, um, statistic. And the larger the fit, the larger this quantity should be. So the, if, the, if the fit is ideal, then the first uh, contribution should be one and the second contribution should be zero. And if the fit is very poor, then this would be a negative contribution. So this, this, um, this, this quantity lends itself very nicely to p-value calculations. But it's, uh, it's something which we have to assess using the, the p-values. And in, instead, um, we also propose what we call the directed core periphery modularity. This is um, it's just a di directed version of modularity. So M, G, U, G, V is, so, so it's not exactly, so in, in standard modularity, you, you would just have one if U and V are in the same group. That's not the case here, but this is, we have a one if there should be a one in the uh, perfect L matrix. If you take um, A, U, V, the directed adjacency matrix minus um, A in, in funny brackets, so the, um, A is roughly the density. So the density would be M divided by N times N minus one. M is the number of edges where we count bidirectional ed edges twice. So, and then we multiply by one over M. So this value lies in the range of minus one and one. And the better the fit, the larger the DCPM. So there were, um, similar uh, proposals, but not for, for this directed clustering um, made by Kuyaku Masuda and by Tudisko. So this is how we judge whether we found something, but how do we find something? So in directed networks, the adjacency matrix may not generally be symmetric. So graph clustering methods, um, which have been proposed to, to look at directed graphs, often are based on a symmetric version of the adjacent agency matrix. So A plus A transposed or A transposed A or A, A transposed. But when you do the symmetrization, of course, you may lose structural properties of the network. And in particular, if, if you're really interested in the directionality of your, between the, your cores and peripheries, you might completely lose that. So, so we don't carry out the symmetrization, but we will compare two methods which do. So the, the first method which we use is based on the HITS algorithm by Kleinberg. So Kleinberg came up with the HITS algorithm to measure the importance of web pages. So he had two scores for web pages. He had an authority score, which, um, which are authoritative in some, some sense, and they also have a hub score. So a good hub score would point to many good authorities, so many many uh, nodes with high authority authority score, and uh, a node with high authority should be pointed to by many uh, nodes with a high hub score. So it's an iterative way of scoring the, the 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 nodes. So each node gets two scores: a hub score and an authority score. And the so the the hub score, um, the authority score are related through A, so A is the vector of hub of authority scores. It is A transpose times the vector of hub scores. And the hub scores are A times um, 
the, the vector of authority scores, where A is the adjacency matrix. So um, what we do is we, we use the SITS algorithm to assign core and periphery scores, and then we use these scores to cluster to get a hard partition. So here's the algorithm. So first we run hits to get our hub and authority scores on every node. And we stop when we sort of reach a certain threshold and we normalize the scores so that they become unit net um, vectors. And then we think of our set C in, so the, the, um, the one which receives which receive lots of edges as a, something which, a high, which has a high hub score. And C out is something that has a high authority score. Yeah. And so for, for the periphery in and periphery out, we just say, okay, they should have a, a low authority score. So we take the maximum of the authority scores and take away the authority score of, of I. And similarly for, for the out core, we take away, we, 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 we take the uh, um, hub score away from the maximum of the hub scores, which we observe. So this is quite a crude way of looking at it. It's just saying, well, something that's a periphery, it's just not a hub. It, it's not, 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 in, not in the core. So periphery in means not core in, or periphery out means not core out. So then we get this n by four matrix. So for each node, we get two, four scores. And then we apply k means plus plus to partition the node set into four clusters. So then we still have to assign each cluster to uh, whether it's p out, c in, c out, or p in. Right? So we have the four clusters. And we do that by looking at the stochastic block model formulation and looking and, and um, choosing the assignment which has the largest likelihood. Right? So we've got four factorial ways of, of matching these nodes. And so we have four factorial scores, um, um, likelihoods, which we um, easily calculate. And this is how we select the one that we choose. So, so this is uh, quite a fast algorithm, but of course it doesn't use a lot of the network information. It just has these hub and authority scores. So um, the second method, which we propose, call, we call this advanced hit, there we, we reward each node for having an edge indicator which matched the idealized block structure and penalized otherwise. So, so we have this reward penalty matrix, which is two and minus one. So we get a reward of one when we match the ideal structure and a penalty of one. So a reward of minus one if we don't. And so, and then, then we run the hits algorithm as, be as before. So we, we do the clustering with uh, k, k means plus plus. And the last method is maximum likelihood. So we can maximum maximize the likelihood using this uh, stochastic block model. Um, a, an issue occurs sometimes that the likelihood is very flat. So then we have um, different starting points for the maximum likelihood algorithm to estimate it to rent, lose a range of different values. So maximum likelihood is, um, it's, is often the gold standard, but it's quite computer intensive. So it doesn't scale so well. And at the same time, uh, you don't need to enforce only two probabilities, right? The maximum, like, I mean, or, or you do in order to get the well, structure as opposed to an, an SVM with uh, 16 parameters. Yeah, we do. We do just take the two parameters. Okay. So that it's it's faster. Okay. And um, yes, you. So we will compare later. So to a method um, by Thiago Pichato, who actually fits the stochastic block model, um, not using maximum likelihood, but using minimum description length. Mm -hmm. And there, the problem then arises that um, quite a few nodes are put in the same cluster. When the difference between the piece is too small. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so just having two parameters makes the problem a little bit easier. Okay. And the likelihood easier to calculate, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, here are the methods we compare against. So the first one is that we just use degrees. So just uh, 
in and out degrees and cluster according to those saying, you know, um, P in should have um, a higher in degree than out degree, but low degrees and core in should have high in degree um, and high degree. So we can just cluster only based on the degrees. And then the second one we use is SAPA, which is a, a symmetrization algorithm for clustering directed graphs. So this uses symmetry. The um, third one is DISIM, as by Rurkin and you, uh, which is co-clustering. So it's meant to discover directional communities. So it's not a core periphery algorithm. It, it tries to match communities using eigenvector um, decomposition. Yeah, and then graph tool, which is the minimum description length method by Peichotto. And we, so, so we started with uh, synthetic data. So the setup is um, 400 nodes, actually we also tried with a thousand nodes. And we simulate this uh, directed core periphery block model, um, 50 samples for each parameter setting. We have three benchmarks. So the first one, we have a half plus P, a half minus P. So we vary the difference between um, P1 and P2 in this way, so P1 is large, P2 is small. In the second benchmark, we fix the ratio be between P1 and P2. So P1 is um, could could also be very small, but uh, P1, uh, but we will still be larger than P2. So in the first one, P1 will also be will always be larger than a half. And in the third one, oh, the the first two ones we have equally sized sets. And in the third one, we fixed P equal to 0.1 because we found that was an interesting regime. And we vary the sizes of the groups by fixing the sizes of three groups and then just varying the one in the fourth group. For example, P out or C in or C out or P in. So I'm not going to show you the, the plots, the, the sort of funny, funny lines plots, which you get for these benchmarks. So, okay, but what, what do we find? So, and for the benchmark one, uh, maximum likelihood has the highest um, adjusted rand index for P um, in the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.03. So this is a small variation. So th remember this is a uh, half plus P, a half minus P. So this is small variation around this signal. If, if when P gets smaller than that, the performance deteriorates. When P is large, um, so larger than point uh, than a quarter, so we've got a quarter, three quarters, then the degrees alone are already sufficient to uncover the structure. And in the range between 0.25 and 0.1, there's not much difference between the methods. But one thing that we see is that graph tool collapses as P gets close to zero. So when signal is almost close to noise, maximum likelihood doesn't do very well, but graph tool just completely collapses. So because it puts everything in the same group. And benchmark two, where the ratio of the probabilities is fixed, uh, maximum likelihood outperforms all the other methods. Graph tool also performs well. And advanced hits is not too bad and actually sometimes outperforms graph tool. And in benchmark three, where we change the, the size of the, the sets, the maximum likelihood seems to be robust against these changes, but advanced hit is not so robust, can even be outperformed by the degree method. So degree is, is very fast, hits is fast, advanced hits is, can be fast, relatively fast, maximum likelihood is slower, maximum likelihood does best, advanced hits does reasonably well, but um, can do very, very poorly if the, the, uh, um, the, um, the sizes of the sets are very heterogeneous, and we will see some examples for that. So. Um, the next plot I want to show you is our quality measures for the synthetic data. So for synthetic data, we know the, the ground truth. And so the adjusted round index, ARI, is the uh, gold standard method because that tells us whether we got the right partition. So then the, on, the, on the left, um, there's the p-value, uh, this time just for Bernoulli random graph, but configuration model looks similar, versus the adjusted round index. And so um, so what we want to do, we want to have a small p-value 
to say that there are structures. If the p-value is large, then we don't reject the null hypothesis that we've got a Bernoulli random graph which no structure. And so, so you see that's that's pretty much the case here. That um, so ARI should be large when we've got structure. That only for very small p-values do we get reasonably high ARIs. But you see, it's all clustered. So when you when you go to the the smallest p-value. Um, all the ARIs are on top of each other. So, so yes, small p so large p-value means low ARI, but small p-value does not mean high ARI necessarily. Could mean anything. And, and um, similar with DCPM, so the p-values with DCPM, um, the DCPM is um, very small if the p-value is very large, it sort of, um, not very large when the p-value is reasonably large. And for small p-values, again, we get a bit of a cluster. The uh, DCPM could either be small or could be large. So large DCPMs we only see for small p-values, but not vice versa. So, so this gives a sort of uh, plausibility for TCPM. And then we also looked at DCPM versus ARI. And you see that there is a monotone relationship. So if the DCPM is high, the ARI is high. To yeah, to, to some extent. So it's not a linear relationship. It also depends on the method that we are using. So here they are colored by different methods. Blue is advanced hits, um, orange is hits, and green is maximum likelihood, where, where we get the highest p-values and the best fit. But you see the monotonicity is preserved. So if we select through a higher DCPM, which we can calculate without p-values and without um, uh, ground truth, then we get a reasonable indication that we might be selecting for high ARI, at least in these synthetic networks. So the DCPM seems to be a good measure for selecting um, the, the partition. So with this synthetic um, study, in the absence of ground truth, here's our procedure. So first, we compute partitions and we use uh, whatever method um, is computationally tractable. So we use um, hits and advanced hits and uh, maximum likelihood when the network is not too large. Then for each of the partitions, we use the Monte Carlo test to see whether the partition deviates from random. And then we exclude the partitions which are not significant because if the partition seems to say there's nothing going on then we don't use that partition. And then we rank the selected significant partitions for further analysis using the DCPM measure. So let's do this for real world data. So, so what we do, we first find a division into four sets. So each algorithm gives us a division. Then we rank the partitions which have significant p-values and then we explore the identified structure using the underlying attributes. What we've also done, we've uh, computed the uh, within method ARI between the resultant partitions to see whether they're sort of consistent or all over the place, and also the ARI between methods of different types. And doing this, we found that a bow tie gives very different partitions to what the other three methods give. So I'm not going to investigate bow tie further now. So it would be interesting to look at in, in more detail what bow tie gives for these different networks. The data sets are faculty and hiring, uh, trade data and political block data. Um, I'm going to, to tell you a little bit more about the data sets in a moment, but just, so here's the overview. Um, so, in this, this table, we have our three methods, hits, advanced hits, maximum likelihood. And then we got our p-values from um, Erdos-Renyi null model and configuration null model. And we see for hits for faculty hiring, the p-values um, both for ER and configuration are very large, so close to one, and actually the DCPM is negative. So we discard um, this partition completely because it doesn't have a significant p-value. And similarly for world trade, hits doesn't do very well. For political blocks with the configuration model, it does a little bit better, but it's still not ideal. So, so we don't look at hits anymore. And then advanced hits and maximum likelihood, 
they both achieved the pol uh, smallest possible p-value in the Monte Carlo test for the data sets or uh, in one scan for the world triad, it's close to this. So they both look at significant partitions only. And then between the two of them, we select the one which has the larger DCPM. Uh, so that's max likelihood here. So we continue with max likelihood. Yeah, so um, yeah, we can also see that the, the p-values correlate with the DCPM, if you like. And so for faculty hiring, faculty hiring is the data set um, where the nodes are academic institutions. And we've got a directed edge from institution I to J to indicate that academic received their PhD at I and then became faculty at J. The data set has about 200 institutions. 23 are Canadian and 182 are American, so US American, and about 5,000 faculty on this data set, so 5,000 edges uh, at different levels, full professors, associate professor, assistant professors. And 87% of these faculty received doctorates, which were granted by institutions within the sample set. Close it at all. I uh, looked at this data set in a core periphery setting and they found that a large percentage of the faculty is trained by a small number of institutions and it suggested that there is a core periphery like structure um, but they don't actually follow, follow up on this core periphery like structure in their paper so this is uh, what we find so we have um, 18 as uh, um, Institutions are in P out, 43 are in C out, 18 are in C in, and 127 are in P in. So, um, so P out means that um, they send their, their um, graduates to C in and to C out, and possibly also to P in, to, to other institutions. C out keeps some of the graduates, but sends quite a lot of them out. And CN also uh, receives quite a lot of graduates and doesn't send many of them out. And PN collects many, but uh, doesn't send many out. And uh, on the right hand side, you see the probability matrix, the estimated probability matrix. So it's um, actually the, uh, yeah, so, so you see the, the L shape. Is, so it's almost there, except between uh, P out and C in, um, P out and C in. We would like to see more more input, but we don't. So it's so the L sharp um, structure is uh, sort of moderately convincing. And then we uh, compared these clusters to to several university rankings, and so we found that the set C out. Um, Includes so that includes Harvard, Stanford, and MIT has uh, smaller ranks, so higher ranks than the other sets. So it's enriched for highly ranked institutions. It's quite a small set, and they send out lots of their graduate to under other institutions. And the, the finding, which was uh, novel, was 100% of the institutions in C in are Canadian. So Canadian means that they they soak up a lot of graduates from the U.S. and other institutions in Canada and just they, they stay in these institutions. So not all Canadian institutions are in CN, but um, of 23, 18 are in CN, only five are not. And so we dug around a little bit why this could be and then found a paper that um, it was found that Canadian public universities offered better faculty pay on average compared to US public universities. So could have been, um, could have been a factor. And P out has slightly lower average ranks than the other sets. Um, so you could think maybe these are um, um, sort of a slightly lower ranked institution, but um, it's, all, it's also got lower in and out degree distributions than the other sets. So it could also be that they have smaller university computer science departments. And so they don't have so many graduates and th they don't have so many graduates to, to send out. So that's our first data set. So the second one is World Trade data. So this is the World Trade Network from the UN with, from the year 2000. 
and here the countries are nodes and a directed edge between two countries represents trade. And this trade network is uh, quite unwieldy and very dense, but it's uh, you, you can drill down to in specific trade uh, um, subjects. So we focused on trade in armored fighting vehicles, war firearms, ammunition, and parts, partly because we knew of other groups who were looking at uh, trade networks in, in this area. So this, this data set has only uh, 256 trades involving 101 countries. So it's quite a, quite a sparse network, density of about 0 0.025. And uh, so here we see a, um, a really nice L structure. Well, nice in, in my, uh, in, so it's to my liking. So certainly the L structure is quite prominent. And thinking of, uh, of trade, you know, um, core periphery structure has partly been motiv motivated by economic data sets. So, so it's not so surprising that we find, find this. So P out has got uh, 28 countries, uh, C in 13, C out 11. So C in and C out are both relatively small and P in has got 49 countries. So on the, on the next slide is, is a map. So P out is light blue. So this is Canada, Mexico, Australia, uh, Pakistan. So um, Spain, um, part of uh, Central Europe. So this means, so these are countries which deliver to, um, to the core countries, but don't take much back. And C in are big core countries which uh, take in lots of, um, lots of trade, but also trade um, among each other. And so this is US, uh, South America, um, the far, far Eastern islands. Um, and so you might have guessed so, and Norway. So both Norway and the US have very high degree in this, uh, in this um, data set. So we repeated the anal analysis without them and we came up with a very similar results. A C out is, uh, in, includes uh, mainly Russia, um, Russia, China, um, um, uh, part of the Middle East and, and lots of Europe. So these are mainly exporters. So they trade amongst each other and they export. And P in are mainly importers. So many countries in Africa, um, Greenland, part of Eastern Europe and um, the uh, um, Panama, Guatemala, so Central American countries and some South American countries. So uh, we used uh, GDP per capita and research spend and military spend to make sense of this partition. And we found that, so C out consists of somewhat wealthy countries and they have a high research spend as percentage of GDP at a high density of export links. C in has a higher median capital uh, GDP, uh, but with a lower up, upper quarter. So they are sort of uh, above average, but not hugely above average in their GDP. And their research spend uh, tends to be lower than in C out. P out are um, economies which are not large exporters, but they export into C in. And P in has on average lower GDP per capita than the other groups. It's got a, also a higher range of military spending as a proportion of GDP. Uh, research spend is not always, always available, but there, for, for the countries where we got that information, it was much lower than for the other groups. And the last data set is political block data set by Adamant and Glantz. So this has political blocks as node and they're directed edge from one block to another denotes that the first block contains at least one link to the second block. This data set was collected on a single day during the 2004 US presidential election, which was the first election where blocks played a major role. And, the, and so we tidy up, we collapse multiple edges and um, we take the largest con connected component. And this is about 1,220 nodes and about 19,000 edges. And the set of blocks is divided into liberal blocks and conservative blocks. And in the uh, weekly co connected component, they're roughly equal size, a few more liberal than conservatives. 
So this is the structure that we find. So again, on the right hand side, we see a relatively decent L structure here. We have um, a large uh, P out and a larger P in, reasonably large C in, and C out only has got four uh, blocks in it. So we, we were trying to make sense of this. Um, the first, we looked at relationship with liberal conservative party division of the blocks and we, there was just none. So they were pretty much equal equal uh, in each of the four sets. But what we found, um, so we looked at uh, some me measure of authority. So here we looked at block spot site. So block spot is a free blocking site, which people can set up quite easily if they want to start a blog and doesn't require so much expertise. So in C in, the fraction of block spot sites is um, only 20%, whereas on the others, it's more than 40%. And there's also a ranking of the top blocks and 39 of the 40 top blocks are in C in. So we, we think that C in is an authority set. But for the other sets, we couldn't actually make much, we, 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 uh, we don't have a good story. So, so this is what it is. So um, future work is looking at other directed core profit data sets, for example, um, uh, Alexander Bovey and Peter Grindward, there's a D missing, um, have a recent paper about the activity on the far right of Telegram, which actually sparked this, this talk. Um, there we run into the issue that the data sets might be really quite large. And how much of an L structure do we see? Do we want to look at other structures um, other than this particular directed corporate structures? Although, so they actually found a, a reasonably good good signal for core periphery and it's, it's sort of plausible in terms of, of Twitter networks that you could see something like that. So also motivated by this work, we are looking at faster methods for such as low rank approximations to detect core periphery. So the quality won't be so good, but it's hopefully better than nothing. And I think from a network science viewpoint, it would be really interesting to look more at the interplay with uh, other mesoscale structures such as communities. So how the, these networks can uh, can be separated and and of course try to make sen more sense of the networks. That's my last slide. So that's all I wanted to say. I will uh, stop sharing. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kazina. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, are there any questions right now? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll kick it off with one. <laughs> um, so in, in like some of the examples you, you showed, there is like, a, you know, in some there's a very clear this L shape and in others it's a bit less. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you always, like, will you always get something? And is there like a confidence output that says like, okay, we found something, but is it really sensible or? Is yes. Yeah. So, so, so that's a, a very good question. So, so morally, when you say, is it sensible? So, so morally, if it was just an ER network or a configuration, the mm -hmm. direct configuration model, uh, we wouldn't even proceed to an analyzing the networks because the p-values would be uh, too large. So we'd say okay. there's nothing significant here. Okay. But then, of course, once you have your network, it's a very good question, which we haven't calculated. What would be the confidence intervals for these estimates? So mm -hmm. when, what is a uh, difference in natural variation? So when I, when I say um, maybe, so, so one of the, the networks, we had a sort of the L sh shape was, um, there were other values which were actually not so far off to what was in the L shape. So what would be the confidence intervals? Um, that's something actually, uh, uh, I'm having a, a student coming in to look at stochastic block models in more detail and partly thinking about confidence intervals for estimation and stochastic block models. So maybe she can do, look at that. Okay, cool. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's clearly an, an interesting problem to look at. Yeah, because I, was, I was imagining, you know, maybe there's another configuration which gives more or less the same and then how do you choose and how much is it due to 
chance or whatever, but I guess that, yeah, there's ways to do that. Yes, I mean, but these algorithms, so that, that's another question, which um, is not sure whether Maria, Maria is still on the call, which we discussed uh, at length is with our um, um, methods for detecting core periphery structure, we could in principle use this directed core periphery measure as optimality measure to optimize, mm -hmm. like, uh, um, like modularity is used for optimization and see whether we get different results using that. But in any case, so like with all the community or with most of the community detection algorithms, we only get the top scoring partition. We don't get the next scoring partition. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I just ask as well, so Gesine, so thanks a lot for the talk. So, so you mentioned that several times the, the, the expected bow tie structure that directed networks have there's been many visualizations of the web, for instance, where you would not have four groups, but more three groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and when would you think that your model into four groups would fit better than the bowtie structure or the other way around? Are there certain, certain systems where one, one mesoscale structure would be more appropriate? Well, they might both be present. So that, that's another... A yeah. baffling part so so if you think of the political block network so it seems that we've got our corporate structure uh, structure present but there's also clearly community structure present and there might be um bow ties so so you might be able to cluster with respect to sort of other but the other underlying drivers which would give different clustering yeah and it, so, you know so, some some tools that exist that really because this is indeed the case and, and this is something that appears for general stochastic block models where you don't impose any shape as you do that you could have very different maxima but yeah. uh, and do you have some are there some tools that really allow somehow to synthesize and to combine these complementary representations of the same system well, what, what we did, we just started in different points to try to catch the mass maxima. Um, so I'm trying to remember. So I, I know that there are some people who try to pull these things together to look at the maximum surface, but we are, so, so what we are trying to do is we, we try to get the, uh, the, the, the um, unique, we hope that there's a unique maximum, try to get that. So we start with different points and then we take the, the estimated value where we've got the absolutely largest likelihood. But of course we might miss something. And, and, and just something else that I wondered is, so, so here the underlying assumption of the model is that inside the group, you have a random graph, right? And did you check indeed that once you've been doing your clustering inside one group, the graph that you observe is really uh, well, well well, well uh, reproduced by a random graph model, or could it be maybe more elong elongated or maybe having different types of structures? Yeah, it could have different type of structures. No, we didn't check for that, but it's a very good idea to, to look at. Yeah, so, so this is also looking at different scales. So we could have yeah. nest, nested core profile structures even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Well, thanks, but so, thank you. And, thank, and thanks for all of the connection, uh, for, for all of the links as well that you provided in the beginning. <laughs> Yes, uh, there, there are more in the paper. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, but when you're lazy, it's, it's just nice mm -hmm. to have it like this. <laughs> Maria. I just had a quick question. When you did the, the World Trade Network, I was wondering if, because you also mentioned there have been some corporate for algorithms for multi-layer networks. I was wondering if it makes sense to do the trade uh, depending on the good. So if the good is uh, sort of more manufacturing, more agricultural, I'm thinking a bit of like product space and different countries specialize in different products. So depending on the type, uh, we might get, uh, you know, a, a bit more of specialization in there that can tell us when a country exports uh, tech goods, they're usually uh, wealthy. Uh, and if they export other goods, they're maybe not that much. Yeah, I think there's a lot one can do in that in that space. So, so we went down to sort of the smallest subject uh, trade specification to just have one, but there's a whole hierarchy. So there's, there, um, there's a hierarchy of about four levels for each type of trade. Uh, so for example, you might have beverages, alcoholic beverages, wine and beer, or you might have uh, uh, fresh 
so meat, then you might have fresh meat or frozen meat or meat and uh, conserved meat. And so, so you've got different levels. Yes, it would be really interesting to do a multi-level analysis there. We haven't done that. Yeah, Alexander. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, thanks a lot for the for the interesting talk. Uh, I was just wondering, coming back to these uh, questions of uh, uh, comparison with uh, stochastic plot models. So you 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 mentioned that you compared the results with um, what you you obtained with a graph tool. Mm -hmm. um, but when you did that, so did you also impose the L structure of the of the block uh, matrix? No. Uh, no, I don't think it is. So, so yeah, yeah. Because, so the, I think it's a bit the same uh, question that then uh, then uh, Karel and 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 Renaud about. So yeah, yeah. Mm. So, so, so the question is, if you what if if you compare with what is the structure that you obtain using a general stochastic block model? Yeah, do you see that that you also have this this core periphery structure, or, or do you find other type of, of structure? So, so we find that you know, in some instances we we didn't actually um, the graph tool didn't pick up structure, but in the synthetic data sets, otherwise graph tool was very similar to maximum likelihood, but it should be. But I mean, in the synthetic data set, we did generate the data using these stochastic block models. So we didn't we didn't misspecify the model as it were. Yeah. Which would be interesting to try out. Yeah, I'm just taking notes about what to do next. <laughs> I think Flo has a question also. Yeah, so I was wondering if you do this this new version of modularity that you defined, can you use it to compare with a standard modularity for um, community structure? And basically, if there's a stronger modularity, like core periphery modularity for a network, it, would it be an indication that a community structure is a better representation of the data than a core periphery structure and vice versa? Hmm. Maybe, maybe we could. Yeah. So modularity, so we could think of modularity having this probability matrix where we've got one on the diagonal and zero everything else. So we, so modularity has the exact same form except that, so the M matrix is a different matrix. So yes, maybe one could use that in order to see uh, what kind of structures are there. See where where this is. Um, might might be possible to think about for so for which matrix is this maximized? Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm not sure whether there's like some intrinsic bias because the one model is basically more complex than the other. Sorry, but I didn't. Might, so you might have some correction term, but I could. There might be some intrinsic bias that basically community structure is easier detectable than core periphery structure because I think it has less variables, but maybe it works. Um, I, I think it's certainly worth a comparison. So in principle, the range should be similar, but I think it's a good idea yet. Maybe maybe some scaling is, is necessary, although, yeah, so, so you have to see how we compare the number of edges. So we would want to compare models which have the same number of edges overall. Right, so we might, might have slightly different ways of distributing them in the matrix. Okay, uh, so thanks a lot for uh, answering all the questions. Um, I think that was it then for questions. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then let's thank Kazin again for the, the great talk. Um, I'm looking forward to see uh, what will come out of it next. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and then soon we'll yeah, see everyone next week again. Yeah, and thank you for your question. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for thank you. coming, Gazina. It was fun. Yep. Yeah. Bye bye.